typically how this is just kind of curious. That first row is going to start. Daddy, Daddy didn't show us the dad. So the position is just showing us how they how they turn to where they were loaded. And then a group behind them, the group behind them, step out to the right, forward, and into position, fire, and then cycle back into the line. So they need to row kind of keep moving back. And so each row is going to fire, remove, return, fire, return, fire, return. Um, and during that time, they're going to reload. How fast can you fire? Uh, you can reload the weapon every 20 seconds if you have sufficient training. How long would, how long would that take? Hmm? How long would it take for training wise? Uh, about two weeks is the what they're getting here in the colonies. Um, that's the standard for the men here. Uh, within two weeks, you're able to hit a target at a distance of about 100 yards. You hit them with a 75 to 80 caliber musket ball, and at that 100 yard distance, you're getting an accuracy of about the set person in any target to just about a week. That's the effectiveness of the weapon. Like, so about two weeks of training. It's a very simple weapon. There are three moving parts, four moving parts. There's my the trigger, it's the bar in between that connects that to the, the spring to the uh, serpentine here. So that's three moving parts there, and then my camera. It's a very simple weapon. Not a whole lot of uh, bells and whistles. It's very simple, it does the job. And, uh, yeah, I can teach you to do it in the afternoon. The two weeks is for sufficient training to be good at it, to be able to shoot to the right of seconds and to be able to um, hit targets to be required. Bernie, going through the rope, is that doubling your chances or? Burning goes into the rope is kind of like the Boy Scout model. Always be prepared. If one end goes out, I have another. Or if for some reason I'm firing rapidly enough that one end does not have sufficient time to recover, I can switch to the other end and allow that to fire a couple times before. The thing is, when I do, uh, drop this into the hand of the gun, there is an explosion because it is the gunpowder. And so pieces of this will actually will actually shrink um, because it's, it's exploding. And uh, so in order to, to cover the uh, flame to the fire to uh, to eat up enough of the rope to actually cover uh, a sufficient amount to that the powder, um, I need to allow it to cover the uh, to, to powder. Uh, and so two shots I can so I can switch between and then one goes out. This rope burns about a foot an hour um, with both ends left. So six inches is an hour and one hour. So you have another rope? I have one of my bandolier here. Oh, I see. The second set of rope. So I would have the bandolier with each of my powder shots. There's one shot of powder called the charger. Three measure now. I have a pouch here for bullets. And then I have extra rope, uh, extra match. Um, and this is the kind of uh, load that you would see a soldier bring into combat at the time. You're also going to have the secondary weapon, the side weapon. Sure. Side weapon is going to be a sword. Um, there's no bayonets on the end of my musket, so my choices are either to club the musket or to hold the the sword. Uh, and then I have armor, of course. And this is standard. Every single man by six, uh, 1610 is going to have to wear, or 1611 is going to have to wear every single one. And it's hot. It can be, um, but when it gets to about 100 degrees, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Whether you're wearing what you're wearing or I'm wearing what I'm wearing, if it's 100 degrees, it's just hot. It's just miserable. And at that point, I feel it. Um, especially if you're a soldier in the 17th century, your choices are sweat or bleed. Uh, if you're getting shot with arrows, arms and legs, not that vulnerable, not that, that important, uh, no vital organs. So your chances of getting killed are drastically increased if you take the armor off. If you leave it on, it's very unlikely that the will kill you. Uh, in fact, that's actually one of the big demoralizing factors for English versus Palatins. Is, uh, is that the muskets are, are going to be, the, between the musket and the armor, demoralizes the enemy to both have a weapon that says to take, to take rope, which we're assuming would have been hemp rope, because all rope in that day and age hemp. And boil it in ash, lye, and gunpowder. Um, well, he doesn't say, but we have found that if you pour a bucket of water through some wood ashes to make the lye solution, and when you can float an egg in it, you get a good strong lye solution. Then uh, what we do is we put a half pound of uh, black powder into the pot. Uh, although we dissolve the gunpowder in water well, before first. we walk up to the pot. Yeah. It seemed a good idea. And then um, 
And then we put 120 feet of rope in it, boil it for an hour, and then pull it out and let it hang. But the thing is, I should say don't pull it out. Pull the pot off and let the pot cool. And now you've got a lot of the salts, a lot of the potassium nitrate. Now I know people who've taken uh, a stainless steel pot, poured a gallon of water in it, threw 16 ounces of potassium nitrate, and, and it doesn't work quite as well. So the way I do it in my home workshop, um, I have an old stainless steel pot that my wife has no intention of using again. It's my, my dye and icky projects pot. Mm -hmm. And that's where I make slow mo So uh, I use an outdoor, uh, I use an outdoor uh, fire. Or sometimes I've been known to use the outdoor coal in the stove. But uh, we'll just put it on the grill. That works pretty well too. But you bring that stuff to a boil. I use vinegar and water. Each man got an allotment of bread each day, as well as salt pork, which is your means of dry curing your pork. I'm going to let you get a close look at that. That's real meat. Mm -hmm. Now, they kept their hogs on an island across the James that still today bears the name Hog Island. Um, most of their food is being shipped over uh, from England by the Virginia Company. One food the settlers aren't accustomed to eating, they ate a lot of, was corn. You guys like corn? And where do you think the, the English learn about corn? If you can eat this from the natives, yeah, right. I uh, hear we've got a list of supplies or provisions that are being shipped to Virginia, as well as a working recipe for bread. Inside our oven, our bread should be just about ready here. And let's check it just to see. Aha, uh -huh. looks pretty good. See that? Mm -hmm. We're going to keep it in just a little while longer. Brown up a little bit more. This oven is known as a Devonshire oven. It's made of clay. An oven like this, you'd have to preheat the oven. It takes about an hour, about an hour, hour and a half to preheat the oven. And the bread itself takes about 25, 30 minutes to bake. Any questions, feel free to ask. If you want. That, those are collars or greens that would have been grown right outside the fort. Uh, of course, the English are growing a lot of their own food here in Virginia to supplement those rations being shipped over from England. Mm -hmm. Enjoy. Welcome. <laughs> oh, look at Just that. Just in case you needed anything. What government was in this house? Um, well, you actually see several uh, residing um, in the, the, the house that we've reproduced here. Um, the Sir Thomas West is the, the first governor here and he orders the construction of what he uh, terms is, is a, a fair London house, a row house effectively. Uh, he's here for about a year. Uh, you've then got Sir Thomas Gates, his lieutenant governor, and Sir Thomas Dale, his lieutenant general, kind of tag teaming the administration of the colony for the next several years. Uh, eventually, uh, Captain Samuel Argyll is appointed governor of the colony. He would have resided in this house. Um, governor Yardley likely would have resided here. Um, at that point, uh, we're not certain if uh, how soon they, they build another residence. Um, several of, of the later governors had additional residences of their own prior to being appointed governor, so how much they stayed here versus their own residence, it's, it's hard to say. Um, Argyll, for instance, even had a uh, plantation on uh, Bermuda by that point. So, um, you know, how much time they actually spent in, in this residence is, is hard to say, but certainly the first three administrators of the colony, this would have been their primary residence. How was this uh, Jamestown capital of Virginia? Uh, for about uh, nearly a century. Uh, it's not until 1699 uh, that the capital shifts inland. Um, so from its, its founding in 1607 uh, until the, the last year of, of the century, um, Jamestown is the, the, the primary uh, seat of government. Now, there's several times uh, throughout the century in which the colonists petitioned the crown 
to allow them to, to, to fund them to build a new state house further inland. Um, they decided that Jamestown was, as the colony grew, just not as convenient a location, not as centrally located as they would like um, for their chief government. But um, the, the Crown seemed to answer with, well, state houses cost money and you've already got one. Uh, but when they lose the state house to an accidental fire in 1698, uh, and so at that point, the Crown approves uh, a move inland. So they build a new state house in Middle Plantation in 1699, which, of course, that town is that leading to Williamsburg. The capital stays there until 1780 when it's shifted to Richmond, where it still is today. Thank you. 